Good evening and welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm going to ask uh, Elder Shashkabik to speak to us first. Hello. Wow. Welcome for, to everybody in this very, very special occasion tonight with a really, really good topic. How do we decolonize Canada? I was, I was thinking about that just this evening when I was reading the, the commentaries here, and I was thinking, how would I translate that to my language? And so I had a hard time uh, thinking of how I could translate it. It's difficult. You have to give me a few days, then I'll come up with an answer. But I was asked to, I was passed tobacco to um, do the blessing, the opening uh, prayer, or um, elders' reflections, whatever you want to hear. First of all, um, Dr. Bernard introduced me as Rajosh Kubik. That's my spiritual name was given to me by the grandmothers and grandfathers some years ago. That means water lily, and I'm of the Bear Clan, and I'm originally from Sagging First Nation. And I'm thinking about the topic, how do we ask for blessing for that? But when I was coming here this evening, I was thinking about we all need blessing in this day and age. Um, every day of our lives. We need that special blessing so that we would have a good day and we start off having good thoughts and goodwill to, for the day. And, and today especially, I, I wanted to... Um, Ask the grandmothers and grandfathers who walked the sacred land before us, our ancestors. And we, we are, right now, we're, we're on the backs of our ancestors on this sacred land. So I ask for permission to be able to be here and ask, and ask for the blessing for all of us and for this very important topic that we're going to engage in this evening. And I usually say my prayer in, in my language, which is Ojibwe. It's very important for me to do that. We I ask for blessing for all of us in this 
room tonight that we all think in a good way and I especially send a prayer for our children of today and children several generations from now. This is the reason why these learned people are coming here to talk about some of the issues that we face on a daily basis. And we have to somehow change our own attitudes and our own way of looking at people. And how can we work together as a nation in this beautiful country of ours? in this beautiful province, in this beautiful city. And that's what I'm hoping will happen, that we'll all get to know one another in a good way. We have much to learn and we have much to talk about, but we have such little time to do it in, so we must become knowledgeable in what we have to do to change. Miigwech. Kinandinoe magra. Thank you. Good evening, and welcome to Visionary Conversations. I'm David Barnard, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Manitoba. My spirit name is Standing White Bear. We're meeting on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. These are lands granted by treaties that we respect. We also recognize that mistakes were made in the past, and people were harmed, and we dedicate ourselves to reconciliation and collaboration. You'll hear us say this acknowledgement statement, or something very much like it, before University of Manitoba events. It's a step that we, as a community, have taken towards restoring and rebuilding our relationships with Indigenous people on our journey towards reconciliation. Before we begin our conversation this evening, it's prudent to acknowledge that decolonization means different things to different people, which is why we brought together a diverse set of voices here today. Although our definitions, hopes, and expectations for action may differ, we're united in our belief that in order to create a fair and just space for ourselves and future generations, we need to unravel the threads of colonization that are so tightly woven into the foundations of our country and continue to have dam damaging effects on our society. It's no coincidence that we're hosting this conversation on the heels of Human Rights Day, celebrated around the world every year on December 10th and here in our Canadian Museum for Human Rights. The topic that we focus on today is an issue of human rights, and it's my hope that tonight's con dis discussion will spark progress towards resolving the injustices that our Indigenous peoples have endured for generations. This evening, we've asked four leaders in our community to share their perspectives on how we can build a Canada based on mutual respect and fairness between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians. Our question to start our conversation is, what does a decolonized Canada look like? With us are Dr. Kerry Miller, Associate Professor and Head of Native Studies at the University of Manitoba. Her research is in Anishinaabe leadership in the early 19th century, Anishinaabe women's history, treaties and sovereignty, Wisconsin Indian history, and cultures of the Great Lakes region. She is Anishinaabe and descends from St. Croix and Leech Lake communities. Dr. Michael Yellowbird, Professor and Dean of the Faculty of Social Work, is a celebrated scholar, author, inspirational teacher, and passionate advocate for decolonization, indigenous social innovation and creativity, and institutional and environmental systems change. 
He's a citizen of the three affiliated tribes of the Fort Berthold Reservation in North Dakota and identifies as a Rikara and Hidatsa. Dr. Catherine Starsik, Associate Professor in Social and Personality Psychology and Director of the Social Justice Laboratory, is a Polish-Canadian academic, a founding member of the Center for Human Rights Research and a research affiliate, affiliate of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Side by side with academics from across institutions and cultures, she's working to develop a measure of reconciliation that's acceptable to both indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. Dr. Emma LaRock, professor, author, poet, and scholar in the Department of Native Studies, and a two-time graduate of the University of Manitoba, has had a prolific career that includes numerous publications in areas of colonization and decolonization, Canadian historiography, racism, violence against women, and First Nation and Métis literatures and identities. Her poems are widely anthologized in prestigious collections and journals. She's originally from a Cree-speaking and land-based Métis family and community from northeastern Alberta. Now I'd now like to thank all of you for being here. We'll begin with each speaker making a short presentation to set the stage for discussion, and then I'll pose a few questions to the panel. Afterwards, we'll open things up for you, the audience, to ask questions, make comments, and engage with our guests. There are three folks with microphones who will find you if you raise your hand and be recognized, and they'll come to you. Please be as brief as possible, because there will be many people who want to direct questions to our panelists. We will wrap things up by 8.30 with a reception to follow. And I now invite Dr. Carrie Miller to start. Bojo. Yeah. So as a historian, of course, I have to look at the history of the word decolonization. Uh, and I found that um, it's first used in terms of a nation completely leaving a colonized space, so in terms of England leaving uh, India. But the term has evolved since then, given um, spaces like Canada, the United States, New Zealand, Australia, where that's not going to be the case, where um, we have arrangements through treaties, where um, the decolonization is more about structure than about vacating space. And <clears throat> also as a historian, when I thought about the long view, right? This is not something that's going to happen quickly. It's something where even in our own communities and among indigenous scholars, we're still discussing exactly what decolonization might look like in a university, let alone in society as a whole. But to me, I think there's a really important piece in starting from having the same story. And I say that, um, you know, growing up, I can remember opening uh, my history textbook in sixth grade and looking up how many pages we're going to discuss indigenous people in the text. And we were on about three pages in the whole thing. Cam okay, old. That's changed. But it demonstrates um, the common saying that history is written by the victor. And one of the things that I have often shared with, with students and in other places is that I feel that the United States and Canada have been, through their, their educational systems, embracing what I almost call an origin myth rather than uh, a settled history. And uh, in that, um, this means for those of us that have taken the time to learn indigenous history and to learn uh, settler nation state um, historical interactions, it is a different history, it is a different story than that which most people are learning through their textbooks. And so, to me, looking at the long-term process that decolonization will take, starting from a place where we as a nation have one story, 
rather than two very different and mutually exclusive stories um, is an important place to start to recognize the role that indigenous people have had. Um, one of the other pages I often see in a textbook is the map. So let's take the map from uh, the Seven Years' War. And usually, or maybe back when I was in sixth grade, the map would show this part of the continent is French, this part of the continent is British, this part of the continent is Spanish with no indigenous nations represented on that map at all, were erased long before most of our nations have lost any of their sovereignty. And in that erasure, don't come back, usually until the civil rights movement at the end of the text. So we'd like to be seen. We'd like to be seen in the textbooks We'd like to be seen in communities. We'd like to be seen in places where decisions are made. And we'd like to hear one another. And I think that's a great place to start. Michael? Did you wake on hot dish to do in the way way get on it to win soccer day chalk or good stuff? In my uh, Rickerall language, I greet people and, and wish you well. Um, I want to I begin by talking a little bit about how I view decolonization as a social work scholar and as someone who has written on the topic a number of times. Uh, to me, decolonization, um, as uh, Professor Miller was saying, in, in many different ways does not fit in this particular context. Uh, it's more something we would call settler colonization because uh, in, in the classic form of decolonization, settlers and colonists go back to where they came from, right? So that hasn't been achieved in you know, a number of different uh, contexts in the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, Canada in particular. Um, and so it's not really what we're talking about is decolonization in, in, uh, in effect. What we're talking about is maybe what, uh, what the uh, conversation is about is, you know, how can we find uh, points of mutual respect and, and uh, fairness? And so one of the things <clears throat> that I've done uh, in my research is to look at decolonization uh, in terms of what it uh, does to the human brain and does to the body, what it does to the molecular systems and the cellular systems of, of uh, individuals who are colonizers and colonized. And um, it's, it's really, you know, evident to me that um, there's been a lot of um, um, damage that's happened to people uh, in terms of uh, what I call neurodecolonization, happened to the brain networks and so on, or synaptic uh, uh, colonization, uh, or, and um, how you know, that's affected people. So decolonization then for me is like how do we then as indigenous people and, and also non-indigenous people begin to unload all of the toxicity of colonization, whatever that means, that takes a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, pointing out. What, the second point is how do we recover those kinds of things that are beneficial to our lives, to our communities, that make us human beings, that bring us together in collaboration in uh, mutually um, you know, uh, supportive ways. And finally, how do we move forward with the future you know, bringing together new technologies, new approaches, new thinking that is, is going to help all of us then to move forward in the future. How can we use the collective ideas of, of all cultures then to move forward in, in, in terms of um, addressing the, colon, the colonization? So um, in a colonial context, it's really important to say then, if we want to achieve um, uh, mutual respect and fairness, it's really important to understand that there's really an asymmetrical or um, power differential between the colonized and the colonizer, right? Mutual respect and fairness is not, po is not impossible, but it's a challenge when you have different kinds of power um, dynamics between two groups. Um, and that's you know, been shown a number of times when uh, people are at the negotiating table. The, the strongest can always pull out of any deal that they don't want leaving the, those that, are, that have less advantage or the less um, ability to um, defend their position and their ideas 
with waiting for the other um, ta party or table to begin to uh, decide when they want to come back to the negotiation table. So I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's a very kind of um, um, elusive process that we're talking about right now, but it's really good we're having this conversation. everyone. I am delighted to be with you tonight and I am so impressed that so many of you came out on such a cold evening. It is really a credit to you. So I have to say I'm a real rookie on this stage. I am the least knowledgeable person here on this topic. But I will tell you what my perspective is and hopefully we can advance a discussion in some way. All right, so today I'm going to give you a sense of myself less of as an academic and more as the person that I am. And as David described, I am um, in part Polish Canadian. That's a big part of my identity and it's an identity that I bring to my work. An elder once told me that I should never tell you what I am not. I should speak about who I am. And, but having said that, I do want to acknowledge that I am not Indigenous and so I come from a very different place and in this work I always try to tread lightly and think about that I should not perhaps take up too much space. I also want to tell you a little bit about our research um, very, very briefly. I, we call it the Canadian Reconciliation Barometer Project and it's, uh, there's a group of us that are working on this together. Our goal is to develop a measure of reconciliation that's acceptable to both Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. And we feel this is important and only one way that we might use to gauge progress, which we feel is important to do as we work together. Those who know me well also know that I never really planned to be in this place to do this work, to do this research. And I encourage you to be open-minded that this may also be true of you today, perhaps, or it may be true of you someday. So in my project, in my work, I'm learning about reconciliation, what that means to others as well as myself, but also about decolonization. And fundamentally, in my view, decolonization involves the undoing of things, the undoing of the harm, the unlearning of ways of thinking, of ways of being. Some of this stuff is not explicit. And so you have to really look for it to see it. It is within us and it is within our governments and our institutions, there are personal and uh, collective political forms that need to happen. It is also for me about the resurgence of indigenous cultures and languages. And so in this space, I want to highlight a poem uh, by another poet from another place, a Mi'kmaq poet uh, named Rita Jo. Uh, and I stumbled on this poem in my work and it deeply affected me. And so I want to read it to you. Uh, it goes like this. I lost my talk, the talk he took away when I was a little girl at Shubinakari school. You snatched it away. I speak like you. I think like you. I create like you, the scrambled ballad about my word. Two ways I talk and both ways I say. Your way is more powerful. So gently I offer my hand and ask, let me find my talk so that I can teach you about me. For all involved, this reaching out requires vulnerability, and it can certainly be scary. Among non-Indigenous peoples, people like myself, this also requires a willingness to listen and learn and openness to change, because change is required. In such situations, I find it really helpful to remember how we are the same, that we all have hopes for a good life, and that we must work together to achieve it because our futures are interconnected. And that's why I'm here today. And that's why our team is half indigenous and half not indigenous. I think when we work together, we can create better solutions. But what does a decolonized future look like? This is what I've been really struggling with this week and my learning still has a long way to go. In reflecting on this, I thought, you know, one of the things that has really struck me is that 
in my work in the last while is that Indigenous and non-Indigenous parents have different concerns. So I'm a busy working uh, mom. I have two kids, 10 and 7. And I've worried a lot about things over the years. In general, I am a worrier. <laughs> I, I worry about things a lot. But usually I've had small things to worry about. And so I was deeply affected when an Indigenous woman I met recently talked about some of her concerns. Like me, she is a busy professional woman and has children. She takes her career and her family quite seriously and does a great job at both. But she expressed this concern, which is not one that I have ever had. And that is a concern about sending her children to school with a rip in their clothing that that rip in the clothing may be a signal to bad parenting and that may lead to the apprehension of her children. So for me, decolonization, as it is for her, um, is a process that will result in parents and perhaps children having the freedom to worry about normal things. More broadly, at the heart of decolonization is a willingness to realign relationships and change how we relate to each other. And so in our work, we've been learning that that requires looking back, importantly, telling the truth, acknowledging harm, learning about history, and of course, also healing both at the personal level and at the collective level as groups. But many also describe, and this is, I, I tend towards talking about reconciliation a lot, so for that I apologize that process as one where we have to work on projects moving forward so that we create a better future, a future in which Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples have equitable outcomes, all cultures flourish, and people treat each other as well as all other relations, including plants, animals, the earth with respect. And as I have heard uh, several people say, so this is not mine, Reconciliation requires reconciliation. And certainly this is also true of decolonization, and there is much work to do. It may take time and it may be costly, but I do think we have the capacity and the imagination to do it in time. And I think that it's, it's oh, sorry, I'm stumbling here. It's important to remember that it's worth the effort. Thank you. always do this for me. <laughs> I think Canadians are crazy to go out in this weather. <laughs> so uh, I'm very impressed. It tells me that you are interested in trying to make things right, and that always feels good. I also want to thank Dr. Bernard for initiating these important conversations. And uh, I, I think they have really um, added to, to the depth of our universities and to, to the community of Winnipeg. And I also wanted to thank Tracy Bowman for um, her great work in organizing, especially for getting me here. So um, how do we build a Canada based on mutual respect and fairness between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples? You know, when I first saw that, as one of the goals for tonight's conversation, I wondered even if I was the right person to be speaking. I was a little troubled by it, and, and I know it comes from a good place, and perhaps I don't totally understand what it's meaning to say. But I have to remind us that colonization is about power, privilege, and control. 
And that means and has meant that First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples have had to have had to and continue to struggle against the structural and cultural forces that would keep them in less than equal terms. In other words, there is nothing fair or respectful about colonization. It is, it is not the colonized who need to be fair. On a different note, a while ago I came to the grand realization that I as a Métis with free trading Métis roots of Red River, I will most likely never be a head of state or a head of Métis nation, a nation that would be completely free and independent like we were in the 1800s. Maybe someday it'll happen, I don't know. At the moment, it really is not one of my dreams. My dreams is for people to be free. And to be free, sometimes you don't need structures. So I turn to the more subtle and more accessible road to freedom to me, and that to me is the decolonization of the mind, soul, and spirit. <clears throat> In North America, one of the most powerful force, forms of colonialism has been in the area of colonial misrepresentation, the portrayal of indigenous peoples has been nothing short of devastating influencing our identities, our self-esteem, and plaguing us with racial shame. My generation, in particular, grew up with cowboys and Indian movies, comics, and textbooks. In our textbooks, the glorification and heroification of the settler, which I prefer to call resettler. As Métis scholar Howard Adams put it, even in solitary silence, I felt the word savage deep in my soul. The demonization, the dehumanization, and the stereotyping of Native peoples and Métis peoples and Inuit peoples, all Native peoples, have not only affected us, Native peoples, but also everyone else's ideas and images of us. And that has had a lot of very negative social outcomes, even death to indigenous individuals. So my work has been about dismantling colonial records, deconstructing them, and any other form of stereotyping in cultural productions, the media, and the marketplace. And at the same time, working to reconstruct indigenous presence in our society, in the hallways that I work in. Colonization is not just about structures, policies, and institutions, though of course these things are important. But colonization is an experience, a lifetime experience, and is deeply psychological. Both the colonizer and the colonized have been profoundly affected. So both must work to deconstruct these forms of powers. So what is decolonization? I'm not sure after all the years of study and personal experience with colonization, I am not sure that we really know what decolonization is. But I'll read you a, a, a definition from a post-colonial textbook. Decolonization is the process of revealing and dismantling colonialist, colonialist power in all its forms. 
This includes dismantling the hidden aspects of those institutional and cultural forces that had maintained the colon colonialist power and that remain even after political independence is achieved. Finally, I just want to say that decolonization is much more complex than social reform, much more demanding than what we've been calling reconciliation, and on a political level, much more difficult because it asks those descendants of colonizers to make some radical changes. And it asks the colonized to be courageous, unrelenting, and innovative. We must all deconstruct the colonizer's model of the world. And whatever decolonization is, it is not easy. Thank you. Well, thank you to all of you uh, for your contributions. And um, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions, and then I'm going to ask for questions from the audience. Uh, I actually have three. One of them, uh, some of you have already addressed aspects of, but I'll give you a, an opportunity to uh, address it again. How, how would what we know as Canada today be different if it were decolonized? As usual, I'm going to come with the history answer. Um, when we aren't using the same story, it's too easy to turn to someone who's telling you about their experience and their family's experience and their grandparents' experience and say, that's false, because it's not a part of the story that I learned. And I think that when we get to the point where we have that common story, it will hopefully lead to a place of at least acknowledgement, if not greater respect. Um, there are a lot of, of social problems, and I'm sure others will speak to better than me, that come from not acknowledging the pain and the generational trauma that comes out of not having a shared understanding of the past. And so, I guess from there, I'll, I'll see if someone else wants to take that up. Hmm. Thank you. Michael? Oh, I didn't hear the question. Sorry, I was asking what would, what would the country we know as Canada today, what would it look like if it were decolonized? <laughs> well, if I were running it, <laughs> we would have no racism, no stereotypes, no poverty, a great education system, free pharmaceuticals. Um, seriously, I guess we all want a much better society. And I certainly would want full justice and safety and personal safety of, of indigenous peoples. Thank you. That's just a start. Great. Michael? I think, uh, I think uh, um, decolonized Canada would look like, um, uh, like a family would look like uh, kinship, caring about one another, cooperation. And when we look at evolutionary biology and, and um, history, we understand that societies that have survived are societies that have had deep caring for one another. I mean, we, we couldn't have existed as human beings if we did not care about one another. And I think that's the, the one of the really important things about decolonization is that it, it, colonization leaves out that fact. We're no longer related. What we are is treating those people that we're colonizing as, you know, subjects, as, um, you know, 
manipulate ways to manipulate uh, uh, or labor force or whatever it is. Um, and the other thing is reciprocity, an exchange of value of things, you know, whether it's uh, material, spiritual, whether it's social, political, whatever it is, there's a reciprocity going on between people that care about one another. And I think those are really important things that we would see in a decolonized society. There would be no need to decolonize this society if there was that kind of kinship. And as you think about indigenous people, indig and, and we all, as we've all done, but I think about indigenous pe people in particular, indigenous people have done a lot of kinship building, adopting people from other tribes non-indigenous people because they were people that could give some kind of uh, life and some kind of um, push and creativity and benefit to their society, right? We do that sometimes in society, but a lot of times we leave people out when they don't have, we think that they have, they don't have what we want or what we need. But so the idea then is, if they, so what if they don't have or need it? You know, reciprocity doesn't have to be there in that we still should treat them like a family member, and I think that's what a decolonized society would look like. Thank you. Catherine, anything to add? It's difficult to follow those set of uh, suggestions, but I would say in addition for me, um, the, one of the things that I would see is that there would be less of this privileging of one way of thinking or a small group's way of thinking over others. And this greater acceptance of the value of indigenous cultures and ways of knowing, as well as kind of this reciprocal interest in each other, that there's this deep connection between people and, and there's this sharing and openness. But also, I really think that one of the biggest things that needs to be addressed is the deep inequities uh, the outcomes for Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples across lots of sectors. And though that requires real system change. And uh, I would see systems functioning in a much more equitable way. Thank you all. My second question is this. What, what actions can individuals, either Indigenous or non-Indigenous, what actions can individuals take to move decolonization forward? Um, actually, I want to um, speak off of something that Michael had mentioned, and then I, I'll move into that point. Sure. Um, and, and this gets to the interrelatedness. Um, in our diplomacy, everyone who is an ally is in some way related. It's why we were using terms like great father um, and, and so forth, um, our, our relations, our brothers. There's all of these kinship terms that if we were talking about this in the language would subsume, would, would infuse um, um, the, whole, the entire discussion. And when we think about the difference between the kind of exchange that we have now and what we're talking about with reciprocity, you know, if, if um, I go to the store and, and pick up a, a bottle of water that costs 250 and I pay the 250 to the stranger behind the counter, we've had a transaction, it's done, and I may never see them again or even think about them again. But reciprocity in that exchange, the building of relationships is inherent in it. That you are never trying to make an equal transaction because you always want the other party to come back and re-engage and reinvigorate and, and grow the relationship so that we begin to have a society that is almost becoming a web of relationships drawing people together. So when I think about what can individuals do, um, I think about you know, building these relationships, building in terms of um, if it's a, a business structure or a university structure, what are committees or um, subcommittees or, or what have you that indigenous voices could come into? There are so many studies that show that when diversity is brought into a room, that the decisions made by that group, whether it is a business decision, a social decision, 
um, an educational decision tend to be more informed and more effectual. Um, but there's also the sovereignty piece that comes with decolonization um, in the sense that we should be part of discussions around how, how things are moved forward, how um, uh, governance takes place. If we're not part of that discussion, then it's still a colonized discussion. I think one of the things um, that I've thought about a lot is that in this time, in, in this day, in this age, in this moment, I have been more optimistic than I've ever been, ever. Knowing what I know about um, what people have been doing to uh, address these really big challenges like we're talking about. So we have the technology, we have the knowledge, we have the thinkers, we have the science, we have the inputs, all the inputs we need to solve things like hate. We can solve hate. We can solve anger. We can solve mistrust. We can solve fear. All it takes is the will of the people. You know, the drivers are there. The information is there. It's up to us to pick it up. And I, I'm, I'm very encouraged because I see that going on today in the world where a number of young people are stepping forward to address these problems. And decolonization is not just a word we're going to hear here tonight. It's around the globe right now. People are talking about it. Young people are stepping up into the political, um, into the political uh, context and becoming part of the political machinery, but changing the machinery from the inside. I've seen that happen a lot in the states where a number of young women have stepped forward in a number of different places, women of color, marginalized women, all, you know, all stepping forward to run for political office for the express purpose of decolonizing and changing and challenging these major obstacles that we have before us. So that's very encouraging. And they are using technology to do it. You know, they tweet these things. They post these things. They're using old knowledge from ancestors, from things in the past. They're talking to elders who are the thinkers, the knowledge keepers. They're looking at, these are folks that are looking at the science as well as the Western indigenous science and taking all of these inputs and putting it into messaging. And it's working. It may not seem like it some, sometimes, but when I look at it, I'm looking at what the subtext is. And the subtext is distraction. The sub subtext is to diminish and humiliate and to uh, get people distracted you know, with what, what people are doing. But it's, but it's happening. And so I believe that you know, that undercurrent is very strong. We have to pay attention to it. Those of us who have nieces and nephews and children or young people under our tutelage, we have to continue to encourage them to take those steps where we left off. Thank you. Catherine, did you want to? For me, a big part of it is in education. I mean, I'm biased. This is like, this is my business, right? But I really believe that learning about things is so valuable and in lots of different ways. So you can learn from books and they're better today than they used to be, that's for sure. Uh, you can learn by reading some of the things that, that Truth and Reconciliation and the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation have published, and others, like the people on this panel. Um, and then I think you can learn by reading, by reading popular books written by indigenous authors, and importantly, engaging in your communities. And that might mean you know, having a deeper conversation with a neighbor or a, a, a friend about these topics or going out of your way to an event like this uh, to learn about indigenous culture or language. I think there's a lot of points of intersection and my experience 
however limited has been, that people are so very welcoming. Um, and so that would be my uh, take on things. Thank you. Emma, what's that? At this point, I don't know if we're talking about decolonization or reconciliation. Because uh, decolonization is, is, uh, is not always so friendly. And decolonization takes a lot of work and a lot of it is not necessarily uh, sort of happy hour sort of things. My business is education too. I believe in, in education. Um, I have seen young people transform before my eyes. So that's been encouraging. But I've also seen young people just pull their horns in and uh, keep going. <laughs> so it's, you know, uh, I don't think it's easy work. I was just going to add, you mentioned that uh, people can read native authored books. Uh, pop, uh, that, what did you say? Popular, uh, popular books? They should also read scholarly books by native people. There's lots of that. It's, that's been, for me, a really wonderful thing to see because I've been here quite a while in this business. Um, but we really do need to, to think seriously what decolonization is. And I've even, well, you know, I, 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 I've wondered whether uh, resettler colon, colonialists can decolonize. Because it used to be that only the colonized are decolonizing. And that is not a friendly encounter necessarily. But we're Canadian, so I guess we are going to stay friendly. <laughs> <laughs> I myself personally like that very much. Um, but I do think we have to think uh, you know, deep, deeper ways of decolonizing. And, those are not always comfortable. It's not comfortable for people, uh, I think, to hear these things. It's not comfortable for indigenous people to have to say them. And the changes we need to make, uh, some of them are simply not pretty. But in the long run, uh, I, I myself have been advocating since I was a kid a much better world. So that will not stop. But I'm prepared to do the less than friendly things uh, in, in my writing, not, not, not in person. I'm, I'm, I'm quite a coward when it comes to that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, for one, have never thought of you as a coward. Uh, I'm going to skip my third question where time's moving on. I'd be happy to take questions from the audience. I, I do have a bit of a problem here in that the light is quite bright in my eyes. So you'll have to really kind of raise your hand or identify yourself some way. Good evening. So my name is Lee Spence. I'm originally from Churchill, Manitoba. And most of my work has been in Indigenous community health and education along the lines of working with grassroots not-for-profits, but also ensuring that curriculum has an Indigenous lens within it. So it's encouraging children at such a young age to, to earn and respect others. But my question is to you for in positions of power because a couple of you had mentioned about how people of power, like we, need to, we as Indigenous people need to be at the, ta at the table. So my question is to you, um, how, would you, how would you encourage people of power to step aside and make space for Indigenous people to be in, in power to make change? Mm, thank you. 
Who would like to start? Carrie? Um, I want to frame this um, in this way, that one of the most central things about decolonization is that the colonizer has to be willing to give up power for it to take place. And um, I have been in, in many situations where, um, you know, settler colonial persons have said, let's, let's move forward on this. And they give a general context without metrics. And they give it to the indigenous people to enact. We start enacting it and move the power bar further than the settler colonial folks who were with us at the beginning are comfortable going along with us too. And that's where we start having the struggle. So there's a level on which um, I think we need to ask our, our settler colonial neighbors to, um, to study the theory, the understanding of, of colonization, its impact on us, and listen to us and our solutions about how to move out of that space and to not be afraid of sharing power with us. Anyone else? Emily, did you want to speak? Did you want to speak? Emily? Well, I guess my, my, my concern about that is people don't like to give up power. And so that's the unfriendly part I was referring to, actually, is, is when it comes down to brass tacks, um, you know, people like their privileges, they like their power, they like their wealth, they like comfort, and and uh, uh, so uh, I'm I'm just saying it's I, I don't I don't know how easy that is just to just to ask people to move over or how to do it so that we don't have a violent revolution. Uh, I see you do it well, Gary, but I I, I have. I, I have this, uh, what is it, what is it? <laughs> I, uh, my Métis revolutionary history, I, I have never been able to, to uh, deal with power directly. I'd rather just write about it. <laughs> hmm. Thank you. Uh, other comments? I, I was gonna say that I think, <clears throat> One of the things that's really important that I've seen happening in, in some of the communities in terms of uh, folks uh, from indigenous communities beginning to uh, find places of power in an organization is that there's, there's a lot of um, training that's going on with, with young folks today to put them in those places so that they're articulate, they're great critical thinkers, that they're great critical you know, um, responders and action takers and they're coming up with new and fresh ideas. That's how you displace power. Power gets embedded because you know, it's not challenged with fresh new ideas. And I think, um, I'd like to tease some of the, the young folks I work with who are emerging as these new leaders. I, I say that you know, you've got the RS4950 gene, which is the leadership gene, these young native women and young men. And, and it's true, you know, they do have, they come from families that have had you know warriors and leaders and so on, and they emerge doing these things you know in uh, nonprofits or they're working with philanthropies or they're they're standing you know on the, um, the the lines against pipelines and those kinds of things, so they're moving themselves in that position, and I think as we prepare them, you know, and as they get stronger to do that, the, you know the the power will will naturally sort of fade or shift for people with these fresh you know, very strong, unimpeachable ideas. Great, thank you. Is there, I'm gonna move on. Is there a question over here? Yes. Good evening. My name is Kara Wilson. I'm actually a student at the University of Manitoba, currently a student with the uh, 
Masters of Social Work Indigenous Knowledge Program. Yay! Shout out to our inner city people sitting in the room here. Uh, so I guess my question here is just in regards to our post-secondary institution here in Manitoba. And what does that look like in terms of decolonizing that space for our Indigenous mm -hmm. students? And what work, I guess, is happening right now for us here in Manitoba? Miigwech. Catherine? Well, I can speak to that a little bit, but I won't be speaking so much about my own work. And so one of the students that I work with, her name's uh, Ilardan and Efimov. Uh, she's a Haida and European settler, and her, uh, the goal of her PhD research is to assess racism at the University of Manitoba and create anti-racism interventions. And so one of the you know, things that we have to think about is whether or not we want to create interventions that are at the individual level or ones that for students or for, for faculty, there are lots of different points of intersection. I know that's not going to cover all of what's required, uh, but that is one of the things that Yolard Anna is working on. So um, this past uh, year, uh, starting in January and moving all the way up to October, um, a group of us, uh, Indigenous faculty, staff, uh, and students, held several listening sessions across uh, the university and put together um, a, a, a document envisioning what Indigenous uh, participation and governance at the university could look like. I don't know if you've, if you've seen that document, it's on our website, you can Google it. Um, but, you know, this is, is certainly looking to making sure that we're at the tables where decisions are made. Now, the implementation of it, which has been embraced by the leadership and embraced by the Board of Governors, um, still is in many ways up to individual deans, up to individual administrators throughout the university. So it remains to be seen how thoroughly it will be implemented. And there's also the reality that when we look at the number of indigenous faculty, staff, and students we have on campus, to be at every single table where decisions are made would make a lot of us very, very tired. Um, and so, you know, it's also us voicing these are the priorities that we think we have, whether that's the reconciliation campaign of the students where they came forward and said, what we want to see first and foremost is availability of our languages, right? And that's something that we've, we've worked to achieve gradually, slowly, at a university pace, but we've worked to achieve it. Um, and so I, I think um, when we look at that, you know, there are some folks who say maybe there should be a completely separate institution, like a tribal community college. But I think that that leaves out, um, you know, that all of us need to learn about one another. Um, and that if all of us in Native Studies went over here and set up a separate institution, we're not helping to train the other nurses, doctors, lawyers, and so forth, um, of non-Indigenous ancestry who would become a part of, of our important um, institutions across the province. So I think trying to find the right balance of sharing that power and voice is the best way to go. Whether we're going to see in all cases an agreement on where that power balance is, is yet to be seen. If I could, if I could just observe another uh, recommendation that uh, that's been made and recently at the university was to establish a position of a vice president uh, for indigenous uh, vice president indigenous, and we've created that position and it's uh, the first person to occupy that uh, that role uh, is a well respected uh, senior member of our. Uh, of our community, Catherine Cook, so we're really looking forward to her moving into that and starting to take up some of these issues uh, very directly. Okay. So, um, so David colonized my answer there, because I was, <laughs> I was gonna mention Catherine too. Um, and I think, 
I abase myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but uh, it is. I mean, it's a really big deal. I mean, it's, it, you can't imagine what it does to the infrastructure and to the leadership of the university. I've been at many universities in the states, Arizona State University, Humboldt State University, University of Kansas, big universities. I don't know of any university that has that kind of initiative going on. So while it might not look, you know, if you're in it, immersed in it, it may not look like a lot. To me, someone coming in that sees this kind of amazing infrastructure going on and, and the influence it's going to have at so many levels, it's, it's, it's amazing, you know. And um, I just wanted to say that because I think it's, it's a big deal. The, the thing about what we're doing in the faculty of social work, I think, is, is really dynamic and it's very, very uh, important. <clears throat> we're, we're doing a restructuring of our uh, BSW curriculum right now. MSW doesn't need as much tweaking, but it needs some tweaking. But the, uh, we're, what we're doing is focusing on the indigenization of the, of the uh, curriculum, meaning indigenization means you know, adding inputs there, that things that are important in terms of indigenization. Decolonization, too, as well, which is different. We're extracting some of those kinds of things that are no longer useful or never were useful, that sort of thing. And I think um, what we're doing uh, with, beyond that is that we're uh, working on and having, uh, working with faculty on developing an indigenous-centered PhD program that's gonna have this global focus that's gonna have uh, indigenous uh, people uh, that are gonna come from our inner city program, sort of pipeline right into MSWIK, and then pipeline right into the, um, the uh, PhD program. And I think um, it, it's, 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 gonna, it's a very unique model, and it, there are gonna be common threads, uh, and then we'll hopefully we'll attract some global scholars too to our program, so there can be uh, these ongoing uh, discourse, uh, discourses around uh, colonialism and what people are doing in different parts of the world to actually address the question, you're, you know, uh, how do you uh, develop a curriculum then that's going to actually decolonize or in indigenize and, and liberate what kinds of liberatory kinds of, um, you know, models and experiences are there. So, you know, we're working really hard on that right now. Great. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Susie McPherson Durandi, and I just want to say that I have been involved in conversations um, around decolonization for, for some years now, and in, currently involved in conversation at Brandon University. And I think about um, worldviews, and I think about how our society is built on a Western worldview, and there was an indigenous worldview that was here before, before uh, colonizers came. And so I think about in terms of um, what would a decolonized Canada look like, I often think about that there's a need for a balance of a Western worldview and an, an indigenous worldview that would honor uh, both, um, both those peoples and, and look at doing things uh, from that perspective. I also think about systemically, like I've been involved in conversations at Brandon University about decolonization and ind indigenizing for a long time. And they will work and do some um, good things, but to me, those changes need to happen institutionally, uh, the very systemic uh, deeply entrenched ways of of doing things that just perpetuates, perpetuates the status quo. And so I, my question would be in terms of uh, the institution, uh, like I really believe that the institution needs to, um, to, to make room, to make that space for that indigenous worldview because as it is, they are calling, so one person said that we would be very tired if we were a part of indigenizing. That's the other thing is that is, that is recolonization when somebody speaks on behalf of us without that back and forth uh, communication. So, so I just kind of wonder what, what your thoughts would be um, on the deeply systemic um, ways of of 
uh, the education systems and how they, it, how they influence and affect uh, the way our students learn. I know that's starting to change, but I, I thought, I think if, if those were changed at that very um, institutional uh, level, that things might move along um, quicker. I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. So um, bef just before coming here, um, we met at a, a book club back at UM um, that was talking about exactly this worldview and, and, and its differences, the way that um, you know trees and animals and all the beings around us are also a part of this kinship network, are a part of the reciprocity, and have respect as individual beings. When we think about um, expanding pipelines in that sense, it's not just can we get the consent of the indigenous community, it's have we even asked the consent of the forest and the land and, and those that live on it that are going to be displaced, uh, the non-human beings that are going to be displaced. So it really is a, a very um, fundamental shift that you're talking about. And that's why I wanted to describe that a little bit more fully. Um, I think when we have people at the, at the tables of decision making, that's the opportunity to share that. That's the opportunity to teach that. Um, where that goes from there, it's gonna be you know, another long period of negotiation, which is what none of us want to hear, right? Um, you know, one of the pieces that I think about is uh, having started my career in the 90s, and Emma has memories before mine, I'm sure, but at that time, we're talking about, let's make sure everyone has cultural awareness in the university. And then we got to, well, I think we need to have cultural competency in the university. But I want folks to think about what that terminology means. It's still surface. It's still great, you know that we have powwows, you respect our smudging. Um, you know that we like to get up at the beginning and, and, and have an elder give a prayer. But have we gotten to the literacy? Have we gotten to the place where, again, we understand the colonial impacts that are coming from suppressing the epistemology that you're talking about? Um, and getting to that literacy, once it's understood, what can we do? And I think um, right now, yesterday and, to, or I'm sorry, today and tomorrow, I do so much I'm m losing my damn on. Um, uh, Lorena uh, Fontaine has organized a conversation around how our institutions can work together on language delivery. And language delivery that's not just in the classroom, but is on the land. And a lot of that is going to be, is going to come from thinking differently about um, the boundaries between these, these traditional intellectual silos of departments and faculties. Um, the most recent conversation I had around this at UM is um, the folks from kinesiology. And for those of you who don't know what kinesiology is, that's your phi ed teachers, right? So very physical. And that's the faculty that's really been bringing in indigenous leaders who can teach students uh, these land-based courses. And so they came over and brought their dean along, which I have great respect for, that he's already supporting this, to meet with us and say, hey, is Native Studies interested in, and see, now I'm gonna shock David a little bit because I'm sure he's heard nothing about this. <laughs> how would you guys like to think about forming? See how I phrase that? Think about forming. <laughs> um, a center for land-based learning. And I said, well, I was thinking about doing a center for indigenous language because of the reconciliation action call, but since they're really overlapping, since when we talk about language, our elders and our teachers say, please let us get out on the land because there is vocabulary they will not get in the same way if it's not on the land. Why don't we have a center for indigenous knowledge? So don't get excited, it's not here next week. We had one conversation, but I, I mention it to, to give an example of the kind of outside of the traditionary boundaries, ways that we need to think about how to bring the education our communities are looking for to the university environment. Thank you. Michael, did you want to speak to this? 
Excuse me. One of the things I think about when you mention indigenous knowledge, it's uh, for me, it's always important for me to remember that the Western Hemisphere, there were, it's always important for me to remember that it was filled with all kinds of dynamic and diverse indigenous worldviews. So it's, it's difficult to say, well, there's one indigenous worldview. If we go down and visit a little further south, we see that the Mayans had built pyramids using complex mathematical equations and, and formulas. They used chemistry to uh, build and, and some of the uh, mortar and those kinds of things. Um, the uh, Inca Empire, you know, again, created these, these beautiful buildings and this artwork. And uh, they had developed, you know, uh, pre-Columbian, 3,000 3, different varieties of potatoes yeah. that could grow at all different habitable zones in all kinds of conditions. So they were actually using the, quote, scientific method long before Europeans were using it. Um, when you think about a little further north in Cahokia and St. Louis, that was a major trade network for tribes all over Turtle Island to come to trade, to interact, to, uh, you know, give ideas to one another, to intermarry, that kind of thing. So these, this world before Europeans came here was a dynamic place. We must never forget that. The, the Mayans, for example, had discovered the concept of zero before Europeans, you know, around the time the Chinese and people in the Fertile Crescent had done it. The zero, the placeholder between, you know, minus one, that, you know, there's nothing, and of course one was a concept that wasn't grabbed until I think the fourth century in Europe. So people were thinking very complex in this part of the world. And so really what we have to do is not bring in a world um, uh, or indigenous view. What we have to do is decolonize Western science to show that people were doing these things long before Western science could claim they were doing it. That's the fact. Thank you. Question down here. Hi, good evening. I guess I come here, uh, my name is Joan Suzuki, and uh, I guess I come here um, uh, coming from the Manitoba adult, adults for climate change, supporters of the youth since uh, the September um, March at the ledge. I've heard about um, gatherings such as the one, the visionary conversation recently around climate change and um, seriously thinking that we're in the midst of a, a paradigm shift in order to address the climate emergency, the global climate emergency. But I've also for many years have been acknowledging that we are in the heart of Turtle Island and trying as I might as a fourth generation Japanese Canadian familiarize myself with indigenous worldview, spirituality and history. And I just feel that the in integral piece that needs to happen in this place, Winnipeg, Manitoba, is that we have to learn how to uh, govern um, with indigenous knowledge and also embrace that we need to change the way we uh, acquire our energy, the way we build our buildings, the way we communicate, the, and, and all, in all those pieces, acknowledging social justice. So I know that's important, but I don't know how it's done. <laughs> so that's my question. Uh, combining indigenous knowledge, indigenous governance into addressing you might call the Green New Deal, but not necessarily. So after just talking about looking across boundaries and being holistic, I'm gonna go back down into a smaller level again and say that what you're talking about is the work of many different ideas and many different collaborations and many different spaces. And for example, we already have um, uh, a new indigenous faculty member shared jointly between engineering and architecture, uh, focusing around design and helping um, engineers and architects to think about design from uh, an indigenous perspective, both in terms of, well, maybe more than both, in terms of decolonization, 
in terms of um, indigenous environmental practice, in terms of um, uh, you know, removing the kind of, or maybe removing is the wrong word, but moving away from the kind of impact that hydro is having to work with communities around understanding water movements that they've been observing for thousands of years. So these kinds of things are happening in different spaces. I think it's difficult to say that there's any one body that's going to fix it all. Um, but I can say that in our usual academic slow way, we're starting to have those conversations and hopefully they will lead to big impacts. Thank you. Anyone else? Emma, you want to comment? Do you want to comment on this? No? Would you like to comment on this question? Okay. All right. One more. Last question. Uh, I'm Ganpat Loda. I'm an earth scientist or student of earth science. Migrated from India about 47 years back. And in the process, I've seen a lot of other people from different countries migrating to Canada to live in this society here. Having gone through that experience, and uh, I will put the question first and the next, give a little explanation later on. Uh, my question would be uh, that uh, with to the, all this distinguished indigenous people panel here, what it will take to for the indigenous people all over Canada, living in small isolated communities of 100 people, 50 people, 25 people, 200 people, where we need large amount of economic resources to bring their level up to the mainframe society's level of living, what it would take for them to move to the centers of major concentration of populations so that we can make this country run in a more economically efficient way. And if you want, I can elaborate the question. I think the question's clear. I think one of the things that's really important to remember is that our lifestyle, first world lifestyle, is not sustainable. So the more people we move into the center with higher wages that can have more buying and consuming power, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a cost to the earth and the resources of the earth. I think, um, I can't remember who has quoted that. In order for everyone to live like we live in the first world, it's going to take two or three more planet, planet Earths to live like that. So I'm not sure that, you know, that's always been the goal of indigenous people to join into an unsustainable economy. I don't think so. I think when I was growing up, that was the furthest thing from a lot of indigenous people's minds. They wanted to maintain an economy of connectedness with one another to the land and uh, where currency was how you treated one another. The currency, right. Cur currency was reciprocity, right? It was cooperation and fairness, you know, was, was you know, uh, a mutual benefit to everybody. And there was a compromise. Compromises were made for people to, because poverty to Native, a lot of Native people where I come from was not seen as something that was bad. It was seen as a virtue because people gave away what they had. They didn't accumulate, it was a virtue. So we move into a society that's about accumulation. That accumulation then has a cost that we see now that the earth is bearing. We cannot continue to sustain the kind of lifestyle we live. So I'm not sure that you know, that's really what we want to do is have every native person be a CEO or to have high wages. I think we have to look at the knowledge that indigenous people have had about having some kind of mutual harmony with the systems they live in. And I think that's probably why there's been some resistance to a lot of people just mass migrating into these systems, right? A lot of us have, but we understand, you know, we have connections to um, our culture and that sort of thing. So um, a lot of that, when people are doing a critical review of social development and economic development, you know, that's always been a contested term. You know, whose who's development, right? And I think that's something we have to really pay attention to. Thank you. I would like to give a slightly different answer to your question, but I, I appreciate everything that you've said. And so, 
Sometimes what we've asked people to do is to think about their own communities. The people that they know, the places they go, the things that they do there. And one of the things that we know is as soon as you get people to think about this, it causes them to see the value in all communities. There is something additionally special for Indigenous folks. I, maybe I'm speaking incorrectly, but my experience has been that there's a deep connection to the land, that there is a rootedness in these spaces, and that I think that there are really creative solutions that are possible even in these remote communities for these communities to thrive. And what I'm hearing is that people are really advocating going back to traditional ways of living or thinking about uh, you know, food security. I mean, Carrie could talk more about this than I can, certainly, but you can, you can have creative solutions to these things. But the problem is that the solutions that we've been thinking about are the same solutions that we would use within these major centers. So I think it just requires uh, more creativity. Hmm. <clears throat> I want, to, I want to follow up on that too real quickly because I think one of the things I didn't, you know, say and thank you for, uh, for reminding me is that, you know, it's, I don't think it's about, you know, raising income or moving people into these places, but I think really if, if, if you know, the really something that needs to be done is Canada should clean up all the mess that it made in these rivers, you know. <laughs> they should, you know, restore this land and give them back their land, give them back their territory so that they can do what they have always done, how they live. I think that's, that was their shopping market. That was their pharmacy. This was their place where they did their, secret, their sacred ceremonies. This is where they were connected to. You know, I'm, not, I'm not sure that, you know, like I said, I think those are things that could be done in, in, um, in, like in deference to maybe just putting people into uh, an economy that you know, is a wage-based economy that you know, we struggle with and pay all kinds of taxes and, we don't agree where those taxes go a lot of times, so. Emma, did you want to talk? <clears throat> did you want to comment on this? About um, centralizing <laughs> indigenous people into this Western economy, um, I, I agree with my colleagues here. That, that I grew up on the land. I grew up way up north in northern Alberta. And at one time, people were not suffering and they were not running into urban centers because they were desperate or whatever. Uh, I have a lot of profound, deep respect for people who, who lived on the land and off the land, and they were free and they were independent. And I won't romanticize them. Uh, you know, Métis communities were definitely not perfect, but then so are everybody. So is everybody else not perfect? But I really find it troubling that people would think that that we should all pull. Uh, indigenous people into urban centers and into this system. I mean, honestly, when you start to think of the, <laughs> the, uh, the work environments that so many people are subjected to in urban centers and in the industrial way of doing things, it, if I could change it, I would change it because I, have, I see people suffering in this system. And I think that what uh, you know, what my community had was was humane and uh, and very lovely in its own way, but it was also very hard. And uh, but but they had a complete whole way of life. So uh, no, I I don't like congestion at all. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat>
want to thank everyone who came tonight for being here. And in particular, I want to thank our panelists for uh, uh, providing us with uh, a lot to think about. This is the 10th anniversary of uh, Visionary Conversations, and it's been a, a privilege as host uh, to be guiding through a series of conversations that ask big and sometimes tough questions about what matters to us most here at home, sometimes across Canada, sometimes around the world. These events have provoked discussion and debate, I hope bringing us closer to understanding how we could live together in a better world. This discussion is the second of three that will bring this decade-long series to its fulfillment. These conversations have explored what I believe are among the most vital issues impacting our lives on global, national, and personal levels. Last month, we discussed the global impact of climate change. Today, we asked a question of national importance to all Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians. On March the 5th, we'll turn our attention inward and ask, how can our community come together to combat the impacts of drug addiction? And we'll discuss whether there's an approach that balances treatment and enforcement to make our communities both healthy and safe. So I would invite you to join that conversation as well, share your voice, help define our paths as individuals and global citizens. You can visit humanitoba.ca slash visionary conversations for more information and to view a recording of tonight's discussion. And I want to thank our panelists again and all of you who participated this evening. I would encourage you to stay for the reception uh, in this space for some light refreshments and to continue the conversation. And I want to uh, acknowledge as we're closing some special guests who joined us this evening from our university community. Our Chancellor, Ann Mann, Dr. Janice Ristock, Provost and Vice President Academic, Dr. Digver Jayas, Vice President Research and International, John Kiersey, Vice President External, Lynn zapshala kelm Vice President Administration, and Jeff Lieberman, Chair of the University of Manitoba Board of Governors. Thank you for coming, and good night.